Today we're talking to Krista Vernoff. She is the showrunner, the executive producer, and writer of Grey's Anatomy and Station 19. Krista has been a friend to women in entertainment throughout her career and is always willing to share with us how she does what she does, how her career came to be, and when it's time to to make changes for that next step in your career. She talks about the magic and she talks about really how she puts herself into these characters and really writes what she knows. We really hope you enjoy this episode. Happy listening. Thank you, Krista, for being with us. You are a, I feel like you're family to Women in Entertainment. You've been with us on so many occasions and been such a great supporter. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. We love it. So um, we often have you come and we we hear from you on project-based um, interviews and announcements. So, but today we really want to talk about you. We want to hear your story of um, how you became a writer, an executive in the industry, um, what what influenced you, who helped you, who didn't help you. Um, just your story is really what we want to hear today. In your words. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, thank you. I am. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on you. I didn't realize that you wrote Charmed. <laughs> you were on the Charmed set. I did the original Charmed. What, I was there for three years. What was that? Le- it's like that's a that's a spelling show. That was a spelling show. Yeah, yeah. So, we're what, obsessed. What, I, well, I'm, I've I've been in this weird place where I'm like seeing like spelling is popping up of like people's experiences and what that was like. Um, was that your first? big network type of experience? No. Uh, okay. It was my second job. It, or it was my third job. Okay. Um, my first job in Hollywood was a freelance episode of Law & Order, but I didn't get to go to that set. Oh, I was oh. going to say, we were like, what is that? <laughs> like, we're Dick like, Wolf Dick Wolf, Wolf, Aaron Spelling, yeah. Shonda Rhimes. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> the trifecta. Uh, I got to write that episode, but I didn't get to go to that set because I had been staffed that same year. I had my first staff writing job on a show called Time of Your Life, which which was a spinoff of Party of Five starring Jennifer oh, Love Hewitt. Okay. I remember okay. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think we made 18 episodes of that or 13. I'm honestly okay. not sure. Um, and then and then Charmed I did for three seasons. Okay. What was that experience like in terms of those sets or, you know, those characters of the creative process? Oh my gosh, Charmed. We're jumping right in on Charmed. <laughs> or we could start over Law and Order. Yeah, yeah. We can start I that. feel like Charmed is just like weirdly following me in my life these days for some reason. But it no. is? How come? Well, I randomly got on, like I was, Spotify randomly put on the new, um, the new uh, podcast with Holly Marie Combs mm-hmm. and the House of Hollowell that she's been doing with like all the characters. And then it was... We're, we were talking to Laura, um, Laura, Laura Layton Savant, and she was Melrose Place, but she did Pretty Little Liars with Holly Marie Cohn. And it's, so it's like this weird, it, like, cross of lines, and but Charmed keeps popping up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize. That, that's okay. Charmed was uh, – I, I love the impact that Charmed has had on, like, a whole generation. Did you grow up watching it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a complicated job for me. That was a complicated job, which I've talked about and, and written about some. And here's what I'll say. It was joyful. It was, um, I was really into the witchiness of it all and really into the magic of it all. And my favorite thing about writing for that show was that um, when we had breaks or days where you're waiting, you're often waiting in TV, like to, you've got your story broken and you're waiting on the showrunner. On on Charmed, you know, on Grey's, we sit around and we read like the most awful medical stories that have ever happened anywhere, <laughs> oh, everywhere in the world, <laughs> and we just slowly become hypochondriacs. But on <laughs> Charmed, we were sitting around and reading like Greek mythology. Like we oh, had cool. all the mythology books and all the uh, – just like every demon anyone has ever named books and and all the magical everything. That was really fun to just sit around oh and gosh. deep dive into what you could turn into – um, an episode that was yeah. magical. I really loved that. That's cool. It's like just the content itself was cool. Yeah. 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 And I was still learning and, and I was mentored as a writer on that show. Um, and, uh, and I was still very enamored of the magic of Hollywood. So it was really fun to, I say that because at a certain point you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> or I, honestly, though, the thing that is still magical to me always, for whatever reason, the thing that makes me go, oh my God, I work in Hollywood. Oh my God, I'm living the dream is, is always the set, the set decorations. When the oh, set deck cool. goes up. So, um, so that, that was, um, you know, that was, a, it, it's just, yeah. it's just cool. The book of shadows was cool. Like I that know. stuff is cool. Yeah. Stuff How much artistry with. goes in to mm -hmm. a prop like the book of shadows. I have a page from the book of shadows. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. I, that's they so made cool. me a copy of it. Like I wrote a spell. I don't know where it is. I, I I don't know where I, I put that. It's in it's in storage somewhere. I'm terrible at framing things and hanging them up, but <laughs> they made me a copy of that page. Oh, that is yeah. so cool. So in terms of like even like the CGI back then to like what you're dealing with now and the technology and the storylines, how have the sets changed? It's like they're kind of like two different eras in terms of like, you know, when you walk on the gray set, do you still like get taken back? Yeah. Still, yeah. when the set deck comes in, yeah. you – you feel like, oh my God, I'm standing in the middle of a movie. Like I'm stand I still, if I go to to what we what we now call the intern house, but for so long was Sister House and yeah. before that it was Meredith's house. Um you you go and you stand on that set and you look around and you feel like you're inside a TV show. Like it, it I don't know. It's magic. It stays magical. You lose yeah. your cynicism. Yeah. It yeah. stays magical. It stays yeah. magical no matter what. You were so generous and came with us to the TV summit. Um, like a few, gosh, I don't even want to know how many years. Those we lost those COVID years. It could be two, it could be 20. So that's uh it's that's so the crazy, span, right? Um, but you you talked a little bit about your your writing and you wanting to create these worlds because of your own personal, you know, your personal experiences. And, and what I love for our young listeners and our student listeners to kind of hear your advice now as what, what advice do you give if I really want to be a writer and I really want to, you know, I think I have these stories in me, how, how should they start and what should they do or don't do now that you're, you know, you've come so far. Oh my gosh. How should a young person who wants to be a writer be a writer? Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing is just start writing. That's that, that you're a writer because you write. I think, I think that's a Cheryl Strayed yeah. has a quote around that. Like you're a writer because you write. Yeah. And um, so many of us are so discouraged by parents, by society, by culture from believing that a career in the arts is a viable option, mm. that we think we might be writers and then we never write because we're told. I mean, my daughter is 16 and one of her best friends was telling me a story and I was laughing so hard. She was like formulating a story, imagining a romance. And the way she told it, I was like, girl, write it down. Like you are a writer. And she said, she's 17 years old. And she said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll it's not realistic. It maybe, maybe I'll let writing be a hobby, but I think I'm going to go into finance. Oh my gosh. And like my whole body ached, like my whole heart broke because to be that young and to already have such and it wasn't even like with a question mark. It was certainty. It's unrealistic. And I'll do this other thing that because I've been told that that's how I get stability and money and certainty mm -hmm. um, feels soul crushing to me and terribly unfair. Um, and I know that I'll... I know that I live in this sort of, <laughs> I live in a little bubble, right? I was raised by hippie artists. So I was never discouraged from art. I was never discouraged. I was never told art wasn't a viable life choice. Mm -hmm. And and I honestly believe that that has a huge amount to do with my career success as an artist mm -hmm. is that I just didn't have a story in my head that I needed a backup plan, that it was unrealistic, that it was not not a, not a valid life choice. And, um, you know, I just want to say, I guess, to young people, like there are a great many people who make a really good living as artists, mm -hmm. a great many people, like every magazine you read is nothing but artists doing their jobs. 
right? Yeah. Every movie you see, every TV show you watch, it's nothing but artists doing their jobs. And, um, you know, financiers come in, right? But it's even the financiers are like, they love the art. They love the art. They love, they all want to come to the movie and watch the artists do their art. So this notion is false. This notion is false and it's been taught to you by people to, to whom it was taught, who love you and mean well and are wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say is the thing to being, you want to be a writer, be a writer, write. And recognize that it's a valid career path and then make decisions related to it being a valid career path. So maybe that's college and then grad school. Maybe it's like I did. You go get a job as a waitress in New York and then you sit down with a couple of books and you write about your life because it's fascinating. <laughs> everyone has their story. You know, has a story. You write what yeah. you know, you know right? It's That's interesting. what they say. We're, we get so much of, and, and I think you've talked about it for Grays, of women in medicine, what it's meant to, we always go back to that, if she can see it, she can be it. But are we showing enough of the behind the scenes? And I mean, it's one of our goals with women yeah. in entertainment, but are we showing enough of the artists who we show the actress and then the yeah. actor, the actress is this role and the person can see themselves being president or they can see themselves being a doctor. But are we showing enough of how the sausage is made so they see those roles? That's yeah. very interesting to, you know, the writers, the cinematographers, the set designers, all of those things that you're talking about. Are we showing those to young people enough? No. Uh, yeah. No. There are some uh, stereotypes that we show a lot mm -hmm. of. The starving artist mm. is a stereotype yes. we show a lot of. The crazy manic diva mm -hmm. is a stereotype that we show a lot of. But people who, who like me, you know, all I ever wanted to do was paint. All I ever did was get hit by balls because I was thinking about a story that I wanted to write. I, I was an artist to my core and I grew up and became an artist who makes a living from art. Uh -huh. I don't think we see a lot of that. No. No. No, we don't. And that's it's, I think with... And maybe with social media and with the way that, you know, that, that it's portrayed now, we see more of it if you're, but you have to really go look for it. You really have to, you know, follow Shonda, follow you, you know, follow people yeah. on social media, seek that out to see, okay, what's behind the scenes. That's, I, that is the best advice. Seek that out. Uh -huh. When you want to learn about anything, the magic of social media, the, because social media can be terribly detrimental if you let it have its way with you. Mm -hmm. But if you have your way with it, yeah. you yeah. can use it to yeah. great education. Right. Seek out successful, vibrant artists in every field and just follow a hundred of them. And then you're getting your, it's like, listen, you want to change your life, you change your mind. Yeah. You're feeding yourself six hours a day of social media, like the average person. Ugh. It's crazy what the average amount of time we spend scrolling is. So scroll through the thing you want to be able to imagine yourself doing mm -hmm. all day. Yeah. And you're programming your mind to believe that it's a possibility. This is also really tremendous anti-racist uh, opportunities. If you just, if you don't understand something that's going on, go follow 50 or 100 people from some marginalized group and don't comment, just read. Just read, All right? Just learn. read, just learn. It, it's powerful. So use, use the social media to educate yourself. Absolutely. In, in terms of your creative process, you know, how has that evolved over all of the different projects that you've, em that you've embarked on? You know, when you're looking at, you know, your writing, how has that evolved over the years? Like what comes easier? What was hard? You know, what are you still battling with at this point? Here's what's true for me. You're going to hate me for this answer. <laughs> writing is not hard for me and not, and it never has been. And <laughs> I love it. That's a, it, that's it, a great it, answer. It is, it is my like dirty secret, right? Because often, often it's true that the people for whom writing isn't hard, it's like we, we sort of say, like, if it wasn't, if it wasn't hard, you might, you're probably not very good at it. Like, <laughs> um, but 
it's been my nature. Like I came in writing and I wrote, it took me so long to recognize that I had a gift for writing because it came to me so naturally. Mm. And things that were really hard for me, it was like math, science. Yeah. So I thought people who were who were gifted in some way that like if you could do math really fast or something, you were really gifted. But I could write, like I was winning awards for my, for essays I would write. And, and my thought in like high school and grade school, and my thought was always like this, I had this feeling like I got away with something because I didn't work very hard on it. Mm. So that now I'm going to, I, I'm going to stop apologizing for it. And I'm going to say, um, I've worked incredibly hard at my craft, but I don't do battle the way yeah. I, the way some people do. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I, I think it's flow. I think that there's a, there's a flow so that even if I'm not getting something right, I don't do battle with it. I don't suffer over it. I put it away and take a walk. And now listen, people who've worked with me would, would will listen to this and they will lie because there've been a great many times when I've come out of my office like crying and saying like, I quit. But it's usually <laughs> when I'm having to write like scenes of children dying, oh, right? Yeah. Like it's like, so, and listen, every writer has a bad day and there have been sure. times when I've come out of my office and to make another writer feel better, I'll read the very terrible monologue I wrote yesterday. Like, listen to this. It's like the worst writing you've ever heard. So it's not to say I don't have bad days and it's not to say that I don't uh, have days where I struggle. And the writing, if I have a struggle, it's that the writing runs so deep through me. Whatever I'm writing, mm -hmm. um, I feel all of the feelings of the characters I'm writing. So that is That's problematic awesome. because if you are writing parents whose children are dying on Grey's Anatomy, you're feeling those feelings. Mm -hmm. And if you're writing children who are dying, you're, it's like you're that. So that's a little bit of a, a, a thing I've had to learn how to shake off. Mm. How do you shake that off? Um, I, okay. I literally shake my body. That's one thing. I get up and like dan dance it out basically, but, yeah. but like I, I shake my body because it's like an energy that needs to move. Yeah. Um, I walk barefoot on the earth, <laughs> which, Fair. which chart, yeah. which gives you a different yeah. charge. It changes again. It changes the energy. Um, my, uh, listen, I'm, it's no longer a secret. It's not a secret. I'm obsessed with crystals. Um, so there are certain crystals mm -hmm. that I'll hold to get that energy out of my body. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, if you go into the writer's room sobbing, it makes everybody laugh, which makes you laugh. Like sometimes you're going for an audience for these feelings because you need to feel witnessed in it by people who understand and they can shake you out of it by mocking you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, with your with your writing that comes easy and now all of these other roles that you've played along the way in Grays and producing and show running and all of this, do you do you have a favorite? Do you like well, all the things that uh, this has brought? Is there do you have to kind of weigh each thing and give each thing its its uh, its attention? Yeah, um, I started as an actor too, so my education is in acting from Boston University. And I've been a director, I've been a writer, I've been a producer. Um, and I think that my favorite thing changes mm -hmm. depending on the era of my life or the moment in my life or the um, day or the hour. Like right now, writing is my writing is my jam right now. I'm like, the writing is such an escape. It's so joyful. And um, even when it's dark, it's I'm finding flow and joy because I'm at the end of a, a really intense producing era in my life where I've been running two and at one point three shows mm -hmm. on network TV for years. Um, and that, and so I'm a little burnt out on the producing, but if you had asked me six, seven years ago, what my favorite part was, I would have said show running, producing, being in charge. Mm -hmm. I like being in charge. I like having control and I like you know, it, I like sitting in the edit bay and sort of rewriting through the edit. And I like getting to put the music on. I get, I like getting to put it all together. And some yeah. of my favorite episodes of TV I've made, I'm not the writer on. Okay. Really? So yeah, yeah. Um, but I, but, 
but as a showrunner, you have a huge, you're, it's like you're the wedding planner. This is how, what I always say to people, like, what's a showrunner? It's like, you're not the bride because the star of the show is the bride. <laughs> <laughs> But you are designing the whole thing with the designers. You're working with all the best artists in the world. So you're not designing it. You're you're letting them bring you things and you're saying this, not that, this, not that, this, not that. And then it's coming together as like a, a symphony or as a, as a, like a really like the most perfect wedding. Yeah. Um, and you feel really proud of, of your this, not that. Uh, and so I really loved that. And I wonder if one day I, I might, love it again. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now the writing is the thing. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, in terms of grays, how is that? It's like, you've been, you've been in and out of the series and different roles over, over many years. Yeah. How has the show changed? How have you felt it's changed over the years? Oh my gosh. Bill Harper, who was one of the showrunners, uh, it, you know, the, B Bill was, I hired him season three or four of Grey's Anatomy and he rose to executive producer and he's, he's a phenomenal talent. And he, he, he says that he and his daughter, maybe his daughter said this, I'm getting the story wrong, Bill, sorry. But one of them did, ha, said that Grey's has like Grey's 1.0, Grey's 2.0, yeah. Grey's 3.0, Grey's 4.0. And you can really see the eras of the show depending on who the head writer was, depending on who the showrunner was. Um, and I, I think that that's right. I think that the show has shifted tonally multiple times over what is now going to be 20 years. That's wild. Crazy. It's so wild. And I'm so excited to see, like, we're heading into Grey's, I don't know what, 5.0, 6.0, I don't know. But Meg Marinas is taking over from me, and she is such a talent. She's such a talent. I'm really excited to see what she does next. But, yeah, it's changed from – uh, sort of the the first era was like romantic comedy, yeah. and then it got really dark for a minute. In when and <laughs> Shonda was when Shonda got tired. <laughs> <laughs> She's talked about that, you know, like planes started to crash, and <laughs> people started to shoot up the hospital, and um, uh, and then and then Tony and Jones era was was lighter and and more playful and and emotional and romantic, and then. Uh, and then there was sort of the era after Derek died that was Bill yeah. and Stacy, and the show had to necessarily become darker because mm -hmm. nobody's laughing after Derek died. Like yeah. it's, you know, yeah. and then I came back in and, um, you know, and I wanted to pull more of the light back in more of the, yeah. I, I, you know, um, more of the early years of the show. And now I feel like there's been eras within this era of mine because this year we brought in this whole new class of right. interns, which is the first time we've done that. That's the first time it's happened on the show to cast five star quality series regular interns to play an intern class. That's the first time since the beginning, since the original. Oh, I didn't realize okay. that. Yeah. I remember okay. where I remember where I was watching the very first episode of Grace. I remember yeah. that too. I, I remember, remember my that night. crappy little New York apartment. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yep, I was my back at my parents' studio. house for something, and I remember watching it in their living room that night because the promos, everything, and being ready for that. What, what do we used to call appointment television? Appointment. Television. Appointment yeah. television. So obviously, it's been publicized. You're finishing. You're you're moving on for you know from Grays and this, and so we we were talking uh, to our, or asking each other this question like how. How as a, a successful executive, you know, you've had different roles, all of these different roles. How do you decide to quit? To, <laughs> that it's time. That it's time. Well, to leave, I, just leave to be something. clear, I'm not an executive. I'm an executive well, producer. Producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But just, but just because, because you have those, students listening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, make those, to, to make those big career changes yeah. that you're voluntarily moving on from something so successful. So, mm -hmm. you know, into the outside world, it's like, why would you ever leave that? But how do you make those decisions? And it's not the first time you've done this. No. You know? no. So how do you, How what what happens that you make those decisions? So it's rare. It's rare in Hollywood to make the decision to leave a really great, big, sure bet, surefire yeah. paycheck yeah. Uh, and job that you love, honestly, in favor of um, what amounts to unemployment. <laughs> Usually you have your your next big thing lined up. And I do have some things uh, that are lined up and, and sort of percolating and, and may um, come to fruition. But the decision to leave the great big job um, 
for me, this is this is one of those things of of my um, unconventional upbringing. I believe mm. I was raised by hippie artists, and there's there was also you know listen drug addiction, and alcoholism, and insanity. Um, so, uh, but I'm a silver linings addict. Uh, so here's the powerful beauty of my childhood and the silver lining um, is that I was not raised to keep up with the Joneses. Mm. I was actually raised to sort of like have contempt for the Joneses. Like the Joneses are playing by societal rules that we don't acknowledge. <laughs> I, mean, like, I love so, that. So um, I wasn't raised I was I was not only raised to sort of break the rules, but I wasn't taught the rules. Mm. So one of the things I've seen is I've had career longevity, I believe, because when I'm burnt out on something and it's not feeding me um, either creatively or emotionally or spiritually, or in this case, um, it, I I don't want to work the hours that I'm working. Mm -hmm. This is really just about like yeah. I it's it's not feeding my my physical longevity to work this hard. Yeah. I need a break, and um and that is particularly hard because I really do love, uh I really do love Grey's Anatomy and but and I also love Station Nineteen and I also loved Rebel, mm -hmm. but Grey's Anatomy and Station Nineteen and Rebel all together almost kill. <laughs> It I almost even, killed I me. I can't even imagine. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And um, and so, but here's the thing. So what I was saying is I've had this career where I, I actually haven't stopped working. I haven't had, a, this is a very touch and go town for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? You have a job and then you don't have a job. You have a job and then you don't have a job and you're not hireable for a while. And, and I have consistently worked for Oh, maybe it's like 22, 23 years now. And I believe that it's because when I'm not fed in those ways that I said, emotionally, yeah. spiritually, creatively, artistically, when I or or when I'm just not at an era of my life when I can do the work that needs to be done with joy and gratitude, I leave. Mm. And it's very hard on my agents. <laughs> <laughs> It's very bewildering to a lot of people because I've walked away from the bigger money and the steady paycheck many times. Yeah. The yeah. first time I left Grays, I had been through a divorce and I had a young child at home and I and I and I felt wrecked and I needed a break. Right? But you're but you're leaving the biggest show in the world, you know, and what are you going to? And I went to nothing. I went to unemployment. I had a pilot that I thought might go and then my pilot didn't go. Actually, I didn't go to, I thought I was going to unemployment. And then Shonda called and was like, you want to rewrite some private practices from home? We'll pay you really. You know? so, <laughs> yeah. But I, but that was great because I could, I could do private practice from home and I had a three-year-old and I, I, so I got my needs met and, and yeah. I was able to help and get paid. So that is just what I've found is that, is that when I take care of myself in those ways and I have an easier time doing it because of the way I was raised, yeah, I don't have as much fear because I don't have as much need for stability, which is what people are raised with. That yeah. like, don't be an artist. It's you need right. stability. It's it's a human need, condition you need, that you, are you, got, you need your 401k paycheck. or your retirement. I don't even know what those numbers and words are. I wasn't right. raised to know yeah. them. Yeah. I remember somebody said the words starter home to me when I was 30. And I had never heard them. I didn't, I wasn't raised with any of that stuff. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my mom was incredibly resourceful and she got the lease to a house in Venice Beach, like a big four or five bedroom house and rented out all the rooms to artists, to boarders so that we lived rent free. Like that's yeah. my upbringing. There's yeah. no starter house. <laughs> 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 so, um, so how do you decide to leave? You, I, I knew a year ago that I was burning out on the intensity of the workload. And I let Shonda know. I gave her a year of notice. And I said, I, I really, I want to walk out the front door. I, I don't want to burn out. I don't want to blow up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to break. I want to know when the finish line is. I want to get this next class launched. Yeah. And then I want to learn to surf. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Be one so, with the ocean. Give it. That, I, I've right? been learning to surf. It's my. It's my. I'm. Um, it's my favorite thing. You, oh, are really? you still in Venice, the area, and learning to? Or no, like we're. To I've been spending a lot of time in Hawaii. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Um, 
do you, so is that your next project, learning to surf? I was going to say, are, are there passion projects? Are there things, are there, is there a book in there? What, you know, what, what's the things that you. I am learning to surf. And uh, there is a book I've been working on. There are a couple of books I've been working on here and there when when the inspiration strikes. Have you written a book before? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really I, – I wrote a book. Um, it's such a weird story, but okay. I wrote a book, uh, the first writer – the writer strike of oh, 2000 wow. – okay. when was it? Seven, 2007, six? six? I feel yeah. um, five or six. I had just had a baby and I had gained a ton of weight and then I lost a ton of weight playing this game that somebody had made up for me, this trainer. And, uh, and then, and then all of a sudden there was this strike and I was really afraid of losing my house because I, again, wasn't taught the rules. So there's a dark side to the not having been taught <laughs> how to like manage money. But I was really freaked out by how long that strike was going on. And so I wrote a book about the game that he'd he'd invented to help me lose weight. Mm. It was called the Game on Diet. Uh, I hate. I kind of hate that I participated in diet culture. The more I've learned about it, but at the time, I was able to um, use my time. I was allowed to write a book. I wasn't allowed to yeah. write TV or movies, but mm. I was allowed to write a book. So I wrote that book. Okay. Um, but. Uh, I've been working on a children's book. I've been working on um, uh, something that has a memoir quality to it. We'll see. Uh, and sometimes I just write. I don't know what it's going to be. I have hundreds of pages of I don't know what it's going to be. And um, and I have a project at Hulu uh, mm -hmm. called First Lie Wins, which is based on a novel Um and uh, I'm producing it with, uh, I wrote it with Megan Plunkett and, and Octavia Spencer's on board to produce. And so we'll find out if that's going to go to series or go to pilot or what sometime soon. Um, so there's little things like that percolating. I've, I have a book that I've optioned called uh, Pastrix by Nadia Boltzweber, mm -hmm. who is amazing and everyone should go look her up immediately and read that. So I have things that I love. I'm not burnt out at a level yeah. of like, I'll never work again. Oh, yeah. okay. I just need to have uh, fewer so hours. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is, um, is your daughter creative? Yes. Yes. And the only way to rebel against me is to be like, I'm not into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to be a finance person. My daughter is so naturally gifted artistically. Um, she's so gifted in so many areas, like so gifted and doesn't uh, – There, she, she has expressed interest in fashion design and okay. um, she's incredible with a makeup brush. But like that girl can sing. <gasps> But she's not interested. <laughs> so so I it's very hard for me. I have a stepson who's in school. He's studying physics. And I can't tell you how many years I was like, he was like, I want to go to the moon. And I was like, but watch this movie. Don't you want to edit? Like, <laughs> don't you want to go to the moon filmically? Like, are you really? I couldn't believe he was going to really go to grad school for physics. I really thought he was an artist. Like, I'm the opposite of everybody's yeah. parent. I'm like, but art. But art, you guys. But art. You know, I the can, other one's in med school. Yeah. I have I have two stepkids and like my husband and his ex-wife, like everybody's science and math background. And I'm like, English, history, art. I'm like, yeah. right. they talk sometimes and I'm like, and the kids are, they're 14 and 10, but like you could see that they're much more like on that path. And I'm just, and I sit there and I'm like, guys, why don't we sit around and talk about a book? That's, that's <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Let's read books. Um, yeah, it's it's my new thing is to really, really, really try to let everyone be who they are, yeah. even if it means they're not an artist. <laughs> it's, you know. Do you find do you find writing you heal through writing? Like in terms yes. of balancing like light and your shadow and all of, you know, all when you talk about all of those different self your own selves, do you find that you heal through it? Yes. And that's why I have hundreds of pages of I don't know what this is and I don't know if it will ever become anything. And depending on like what era of therapy I'm in, sometimes it's really funny and sometimes it's really dark and sometimes the same story is in my computer like real dark and really funny. And yeah. um and yes, I heal through writing. It is a healing modality for me. Yeah. And I heal through often um, writing my real life or my lived experiences and hiding behind the fictionalized characters on television. I, I was just going to ask if, <laughs> if, your, uh, if those truths are in those characters. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think 
I think that we all do that at Grey's Anatomy. We all drop in to our scary, our most scared selves and our most emotional mm -hmm. selves and our most um, damaged and broken and flawed and romantic and hopeful selves. And we write from that place. And that's why that show has such a l yeah. such longevity is is like people resonate with the with the emotional truth. People yeah. resonate with the truth, and we're writing from a true place. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well it's beginning. when you look at characters and how you relate to them. It's you know you're you're subconsciously exploring different parts of yourself, which is why you aspire to be certain people or characters or you look at different you know different characters in different ways whether you hate them you love them you like yeah, them like yeah. there's reasons behind it right right and the best even the best science fiction charmed you know yeah. is is part of why people resonate with those witches is because they are sisters first yeah they are sisters first yeah. they are written from a very human place and then there's magic on top of it there's a lot of shows. Buffy was the same way. Yeah. They were, those were high schoolers first. And then there just happened to be vampires in the yeah. world, you know. How do you ground yourself in your writing? What do you mean? Well, when you're writing and, you know, obviously you were talking earlier about if you're writing a, a dying child or a dying scene. But if you're sitting there and you're looking at the characters or a story arc, how do you ground yourself to really kind of get into that character? Because I would assume... You need you put yourself what like how do you balance yourself in that or what you kind of fictionalize and that is so hard for me to answer okay. because that part is the magic part yeah uh, for me that's the easy part the hard part for me like when you go what do you what do you wrestle with or what yeah. do you work on as a writer it's like it was really hard and it took years for me to really understand structure in a mm -hmm. screenplay. And every hour of TV is really just sort of a shrunken down screenplay. I came into Grey's Anatomy, you know, they always ask like, what's your strength? Like, which writer are you going to be in the room? And I was always like, I'm the character girl. I'm the dialogue girl. And then within a few years of Grey's Anatomy, and by the time we were at year three or four of Grey's, that was year eight or nine of my writing career, um, I suddenly was the person that people were coming to for story. Now I'm the story person in the writer's room. I, I, it's like you put in your 10,000 hours, your 20,000 yeah. hours, the Malcolm right, Gladwell, right. 20, how many hours is it? 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I had put in my hours and all of a sudden I know if you don't have the right act out, mm -hmm. I know if you, if you're not building to anything, I, I can see pretty quickly story holes or structure or plot issues. Um, but that took a lot of work, a lot of work for me to learn. The question that you just asked of like, how do you drop in? My, I'm like, what do you mean? Because that is the part I didn't have to work at. That yeah. is the part, that's the magic, that's the muse. I'll tell you this though, I have an 11th hour muse. My muse only comes up against a really tight deadline, <laughs> which is why TV is great for me. Okay. So, so, and I'll tell you this for, for the students who are listening or the aspiring people who have busy lives and busy careers. I had a friend who, um, who understood who I, who she had gone to USC film school. I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to school for writing. Um, and, and I had been given this assignment by this person who was maybe going to become my agent, right? I had met this agent through a series of, of magical consequences. And, um, she had read one of my scripts and she had said she wanted to read something else and, and that I should try my hand at hour long. I had written sit sitcom specs initially. So I was going to write an episode of Felicity and I hadn't started. And I said it to my friend, Holly. And she said, what do you mean? You have an agent interested and you haven't done the work she gave you. And I was like, I just can't make myself sit down and do it. She was like, oh, oh, oh I, got I got it. You want the system for that? And I was like, yes, please. And she said, you put, you put things you want to do in your calendar, but you're not allowed to do them if you haven't written your pages for the day. So she said, you know how fast you write. Some people write two pages a day. Some people write four pages a day. Some people write seven pages a day. You know, some people write 15 pages a day. It depends where you are in your career and what mm -hmm. modality you're working in, right? So my thing was six pages a day. I had to write six pages a day of a script, which is way 
easier than six pages of like a book, right? <laughs> There's a lot of white space in a script. <laughs> I had to write six pages a day if I wanted to go to lunch with my friend Peter. I had to write six pages that day if I wanted to do the hike that I had put on the books for 4 p.m. that day. She said, fill your calendar with things that all the things you want to do, the gym. You can't go to the gym until you've written your six pages today. I had that Felicity script written inside a week. Wow. Because the rule was I'm not allowed to do that thing unless I've written these pages, which gave me a deadline. 4 p.m. I'm going on that hike. So I have to get these pages written before 4 p.m. And that activated my creativity because I need a deadline to write. It also, I made a 100% commitment to that plan. I'm not allowed to leave my house to do the thing I want to do if my pages are not written. Now, listen, I was young and I didn't have kids and I, you know, it was like, you can do your job, right? She was like, you can go to your job, but that's it. Like none of the fun stuff can you do. But there were days when it was like I had to go to a job. So I I would, and I would be like, oh, and I want to go to dinner tonight with a friend. So I would get up at 6 a.m. to write my pages. If you do something 100%, it becomes easy. If you do it 99%, it's torture. That's yeah. somebody's quote that I don't know who. But that's like, I don't drink. And if you try to quit drinking 99%, you're obsessed about it in your head every day of your life. But if you quit 100%, if it's just not an option, it's off the table. It's easier. So um, this was my plan for writing. And that is how I had deadlines before people were paying me to have deadlines. So um, my muse kicks in at the 11th hour. My writing is not good if I have too much lead time. So if you give, and I'm a very, very fast writer now. So if you give me a week to write a script, it's like your draft is due in a week. I will not write for the first four days. I will not write. Honestly, okay, truth is I won't write for the first five and a half days. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I was like, that's even more generous. <laughs> I won't write for the first five and a half days. And I used to torture myself during that time yeah. that I wouldn't write for five and a half days. Like, oh, be, you know, beating yourself up. You're going to the movies, but you're beating yourself up. I should be writing. And then when I just really accepted about myself that I have a muse that activates at the 11th hour and I and the writing I'll do if I'm doing a little bit every day won't be as good as the 11th hour writing. Mm-hmm. So just don't beat myself up. Yeah. Just sit, just clear the calendar for the two days prior yeah. to the deadline. That when I write movies, which I do occasionally, mm-hmm. I uh, cannot roll with the two years to write a movie. I cannot roll with it. So I write it like I have a deadline in two weeks and I make up games like the one I just described to you. I can't go on that vacation or buy that thing unless I have a draft by this date. And then I, and then I put it in a drawer and then I look at it a month or two later and I'm like, Oh, that's kind of a mess. And then I write it again Mm -hmm. and write it again. Um, that, that way, cause, cause a little bit every day for two years, I I just, I'll just die. I just won't care anymore. I'll stop caring. So I have to create systems and this is advice for young folks and writers who are listening and artists who are listening, you have to create systems to trick yourself into productivity and into success. Yeah. And in and you have to know yourself well enough to know and accept what your process is. If you need the whole two weeks, then you need to take the whole two weeks and you need to know if you're a two pages a day writer, then you need to ask for or create enough time mm-hmm. that you have time to only write two pages a day. I don't, you probably can't work in TV. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pick up the pace, buddy. Yeah. 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 But I, I can totally understand that. It's like, even in, it's like, I, I have a PR company, but like, even for me, like proposals, every, I'm always like 11th hour. I'll mm-hmm. wake up at five in the morning and it's due at seven. Like those are like, I'm, and those, are that's, ones. That, yeah. and those are the best ones where I'm like, there's no mistakes. There's no like, boom, goes out that's, best ideas. Like the ones that I'm like, oh, I have a week. And I'm like, I'm never going to get out <laughs> touch it until like a day before I truly feel bad. It goes out. Yeah. Like, so it's, that's so, so now somebody gave me permission. Somebody, some, somebody in my life who was like a coach for businesses and managing employees explained to me that like, that what you just described describes Mm -hmm. about 40% of people. Mm -hmm. And then there's like 60% of people who do better with time and focus and consistency. And, and that 
those people who are not in the 40% that you and I are in have a really hard time understanding our process. Oh, and, believing, and we have a little bit of a hard time understanding theirs. We're like, just do it, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so knowing yourself um, enough to let yourself off the hook while you're procrastinating saves so much sanity and saves yeah. your nervous system to just be like, that's how I am. That's how I am. But here's a trick. Here's a trick he taught me. When you're dealing with people who are the other kind, you have to say sentences like, let me think about that and get back to you because then they feel <laughs> <laughs> they feel like you are. That you're taking them seriously, <laughs> that you're a legitimate human being. Like yeah. they have a really hard time that they can't imagine that we're wired the way that yeah. we're wired. So it feels dismissive of them when we haven't – like when we know immediately what we yeah. want it to be. So also that's like a managerial yeah. thing is it's, like yeah. is speaking to – speaking to the audience that you're speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. And it also yeah. goes to even like what I was saying before with my, like with my husband and my stepkids, cause they're like very like disciplined, they're very disciplined and very like, cause they're methodical because of just they're how they're science. wired. Yeah. Right. And then I'm like, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, did you even under, like, where are we? <laughs> yeah. And when I'm in that space, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you when I'm in like a, okay, now it's the 11th hour and the work has to be done. I can't hear or no. see anything else. That's all I see. I'm like in a tunnel. I, people can walk into my office when I'm writing in that state. And like, this is a true thing that happens not just once or twice often. I'll be like, you guys, I'm starving. I need some food. And then like, I'll look up three hours later and I'll be like, I'm starving. And then I'll look and they brought me soup and they brought it two and a half hours ago. <laughs> And yeah. it's sitting next to me freezing cold. <laughs> and you never noticed it. <laughs> I did not see them. I did not hear them. I did yeah. not smell it. I did not notice it. I'm oh gone into this other yeah. place. Yeah. So it's a real hyper-focused place mm. that I go no, to. No, I completely – and it's almost like one of those things where I know – if somebody comes in and says something, I'm like, if I'm not looking directly at you, it's not even like in my realm of right. what I'm doing because I'm so hyper focused. Because I can bang out like probably 15 hours of work in three hours. Yes. That's how you're you train yourself and yes. that's how your mind works. And then it's like, but I'm like, if you walk in and ask me questions, I'm just going to, I'm I'm never going to remember the conversation. <laughs> My husband knows that he yeah. has to like, because I'm also incredibly good. I don't know how I developed the skill. It wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. Incredibly good at sounding like I heard you. <laughs> so apparently I will be like writing and my husband will walk in and be like, you know, here's what I hear. And I'll go, huh? But that's all I heard was, uh-huh. But so he's learned after years of being with me that he has to wait. He'll just stand there then. And then like his presence becomes like this pulse, like that's <laughs> breaking into my tunnel. And then I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you like look up. And then he's, he will say the whole thing again if it's important. Yeah, right. And then I need to blink a few times and then he'll say it again. <laughs> That's yeah. I have I, I have that's process love right there. coming out from underwater. Yeah, yeah. And and I'll, and if he forgets to like I tr I trick him sometimes. He doesn't realize I'm real deep sometimes. And then I'll be like, "What is this party on the calendar for tonight?" He'll be like, "I told you four times all week. I've said it, and I'm in my head doing something else. I look yeah. like I'm." cooking beside you, but I am no, breaking yeah. a story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can really like my husband's pretty much like he'll ha he'll tell me something and then like a half hour later be like, hey, what happened with this? He's like, I told you a half hour ago. What right. happened? Didn't He's like, it. you weren't you weren't even working. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You weren't slacking. You weren't <laughs> like <laughs> No, I was and that's what's also true. That's what yeah. I've come to understand about my process is if you've given me two weeks to write a script and I didn't do anything for 12 days, I was chewing on it. it. It was working in a different part of my yeah. brain. It was uh, so that when I'm sitting down to write, it's not like you haven't thought about it. It's yeah. not like yeah. no yeah. thought has gone yeah. in, but it, but I did read a book that they've really now researched like how many different parts of the brain are involved with the final product. Yeah. And that part of the work of a, a really, really excellent work is getting it out of the prefrontal cortex and letting the rest of the brain go to work on it. So knowing what the story you're going to tell is and then doing other things, you are actually working on it. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. interesting. As you're leaving or, you know, exiting and in, in Grace, like you were just telling us, 
do you feel like with this new group of interns and this, you know, the people who are going to be in charge of it now, do you feel like your stamp is still there or is your little piece of you is going to kind of continue on or how do you, a little legacy, I guess, is that, is that still there or does it kind of end and a new like 6.0 comes along? Um, I invented these new five interns okay. um, and it was a great joy uh, and labor of love to come up with these interns. And, and so I do feel like, but honestly, like, I feel like I'm in the fabric of the show from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I feel like Grey's Anatomy is, is, um, uh, it's career defining for me. And yeah, I, I feel like I'm cooked into that place and that place is cooked yeah. into me. And Meg is so gifted. I, I'm i really not worried. I'm excited to see uh, what she does. Uh, yeah. You know what? I don't think I know the story. How did you meet Shonda and Betsy? Oh, I was staffing. I was a writer. I was coming off I did Charmed for three years, and then I did Wonder Falls, oh. uh, which was a Brian Fuller show okay. um, directed by Todd Holland, and we did one season, 13 episodes. It was a delightful show. Um, and then I was in back, and then it was canceled. It was canceled two. We aired two episodes. It oh, was canceled. Wow. Um, but it became like a, a – I don't know how the fan – they must have put out DVDs or something yeah. because it's a little bit of a cult thing. Uh -huh. People know Wonder Falls. Um, and then I was in what we call staffing season in Hollywood, which is, you know, your agent sends out your scripts, your writing samples. Okay. And you read all the pilots that got made this year. And then, and they're all reading you basically. If you have a good agent, they're all reading your script and you're reading them. And then the ones who want to meet you call you in for a meeting. And, um, I got called in for a meeting on, on Grey's Anatomy before it was called Grey's Anatomy. And Betsy wasn't there, but Shonda was there and Jim Perriott. Oh, okay. And um, this is my memory of that. Uh, Stacy McKee, who went on to create Station 19, mm -hmm. was Jim Perriott's assistant at that time. Oh, gosh. And gosh. Shonda and Jim were running late or talking about their last interview or something. And so I was sitting in the outer office with Stacy, and we were talking about American mm -hmm. Idol. Uh, and then... Sean, it was season two of American Idol, I think, and we were discussing whatever had happened the night before. And I hear Shonda's voice bellow from the next room, don't talk about American Idol without me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay. <laughs> and she comes out and, and she comes in and she's like, okay, first, were you Kelly or were you Tamira? <laughs> And I was like, I was Kelly. And she was like, I was Tamira. And that, and that, by the way, describes me and Shonda. Like we are like sisters and opposites. <laughs> you know? So, um, so we talked about American Idol for 45 minutes and Jim Perriott sat there just like this. <laughs> and then he was like, and then he finally just like looked at, like he was like looking at something. It was before iPhone. So he wasn't looking at his phone. Um, but he just was looked up from whatever. And he said, you realize you're talking yourself out of a career. <laughs> like not me as a job interviewee, but Shonda and I watching American Idol and being this obsessed with it. He was like, that was when, that was early in reality TV. Yeah, it was like, yeah. it's going to, there was a lot of fear that it was going to take over and there weren't going to be scripted jobs. Yeah. yeah. So, but Shonda, you know, Shonda and I had a great conversation about American Idol and then she hired me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> also, by so the way, she was a big Charmed fan. Really? Yes. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I, um, but I think what's, one of the things I think is so interesting about Grey's and the mentorship capacity of everybody kind of evolving into new roles is you see so many series now that try to reinvent themselves. Like, you know, whether it's like a new 90210 or a new Melrose for this next generation. And I feel like, Grey's has created this arc where both the people in front of the camera and behind the camera have just evolved into this new era where you have a new fan base. You can still re you're reaching yeah, new audiences. You didn't have where to stop and start. You don't stop and start. <laughs> Everybody just kind of evolved, whether it's coming and going, coming back to the show, yeah. or even like private practice and all of these breakoffs. You know, it, it's it's like lightning in a bottle, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, that was a big conversation when, it, when we wanted to bring in this new cast uh, yeah. was, do we end Grey's Anatomy and make a spinoff or a next mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. show? Yeah. Or is it just Grey's Anatomy? Even though Ellen is ready to move on, mm -hmm. her name is on the building. The hospital is Grey Sloan. So 
is it, and, and it was determined it is still Grey's Anatomy. Like Grey's Anatomy is in hundreds of territories worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to let Grey's Anatomy go as long as there's stories to tell, as long as yeah. there are stories to tell and people who want to watch them. And so that was, um, yeah, it was a conversation yeah. and it was a decision and, and, uh, and I've had the joy of running Grey's Anatomy and sort of reinventing Grey's Anatomy while also running one of the spinoffs yeah. cause Stacy moved on a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and so being in that world and getting to cross Jason, George, Ben Warren yeah. back over, yeah. back and forth and Ben and Bailey sort of being a crossover couple and, mm -hmm. and all of that is like, um, for my brain, it, it's, it was such a challenge. It was such a puzzle and, yeah. and it there, and there's so much, um, that's the stuff that's hard for me. And so the satisfaction of like a job well done when we get it right is, is I worked hard at that. Yeah. And and with a great deal of support from a great many gifted writers and directors and yeah. actors. I was yeah. sad about private practice. I, I love that. I do too. It's like the, the storylines, it was just such a, I don't know, whether it's the time or the content or the matter, you just kind of don't, like, it's just, it was just such a great spinoff. Kate Walsh is a super talent. Yeah. yeah. Like, she's a super talent. And I don't even think I realized to that to what degree until this season of Grey's Anatomy. She's been recurring again yeah. this season yeah. on Grey's Anatomy. And I I I wrote to her this week and I was like, everything you touch turns to gold. Like you're Emily in Paris too. You, she's in that. She, <laughs> she's hilarious. She's hilarious. She is funny. She's dramatic. She's yeah. raw. She's present. She she's she's a super talent. Yeah. 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 So she is so funny. And yeah, she is funny in Emily and Pierce. Well, I think we're getting the the time, yeah. but we want to ask you, first of all, thank you, Krista, so much for coming. But we also, uh, we touched on it a little bit. We are starting a women in entertainment, not a book club. It's called, we're calling it the book nook, which is recommendations of books and books that were meaningful. And you touched on a couple of books that you loved. And so we wanted to see with our listeners, if you have books in your history that were super important, something you're reading now, oh but just God, something we could that do a whole hour, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. That's books what it... are my salvation. Yeah. Books were my salvation as a child. I I think it it's you know because my childhood was actually pretty bananas. Like I had I have <laughs> focused on what I think is beautiful that came out of it, but it was pretty nuts. And books were my they were my saving grace. Oh, so yeah. books that were, I mean, I'm just going to like, let me just name a few books that have been pivotal yes. for me. Handmaid's Tale made me want to be a writer, Margaret Atwood. Um, I never watched the TV series because that book is so sacred to me. I just can't. I, I can't. Yep. Um, uh, everything by Tom Robbins carried me through college. Just everything. Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, like ugh, another roadside attraction. Uh -huh. Like, Read Tom Robbins if you haven't read Tom Robbins. I'm sure it's problematic by today's standards. I haven't read it in 20 years, but wow. Um, everything by Anne Lamott, yes. particularly mm. her memoirs, mm. were life-changing for me. Um, uh, Operating Instructions and, and Traveling Mercies. Um, everything by Cheryl Strayed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wild and Tiny Beautiful Things. Yeah. Are, I just bought Tiny Beautiful too. Things. I haven't read it yet. Oh, my God. Like I'm jealous. I'm jealous that you haven't read that book First yet. time. It's like yeah. going back. Yeah. Oh my God. Were you, a, were you a library kid? I was a library yeah. kid. I had a library card and the librarians often, if I, and we moved around a lot, they would look at me with my like stack of books and they, and they would sort of like, there was no way I was going to read all those books this week, but definitely I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what, what lately I've been reading, um, a lot of Ann Patchett lately mm, okay. and her, yes. her book of essays. Yes. Man, there's an essay inside that book. Oh God, I can't think of the name of the book, and I can't think of the essay. But her, she just wrote one book yeah, of essays. Yeah, Go get that did, book. Yeah. It's so. Have you ever been to her bookstore? Beautiful. I haven't. I haven't, I haven't but I want to go. Yeah, it's it? Nashville, yeah. right? Okay. Nashville, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I read a book um, by Kylie Reed. Can't think of the name of it right now, but look her up. She's an incredible newer voice. Um, why can't I think of the names of the current books that I'm reading? No, I'm it happens. So <laughs> We've been going through it. Like we well, do this I'm all so the time. happy to hear you because I'm like, am I not a serious reader? Because I, I can't, can't recall every no, name. No, no, no. I'm I'm just so tired. I, We're tired. I feel so uh, vindicated. <laughs> as I get older, my brain lets go of what yeah. I don't need to carry around today. So everything by Barbara Kingsolver. Everything by Barbara Kingsolver. Hmm. Oh, God, she's wonderful. And, you know, 
like Steinbeck was a definitive yeah, author the, for the me, the Grapes of Wrath. Well, like, Krista, thank you so, so much for coming. We're, you're so, we're so generous with us. Thank we you so much. It. Thank you so much for having me. I love that you're doing this. I'll, I'll, I'll listen. Thank I'll, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womenandentertainment.com.